Hak Sameach, everybody. So you know that this past Saturday, four hostages were rescued, and it was uh, remarkable. And there was a great deal of celebration in Israel, but it took place on Shabbat. And so not everybody got the news right away because people who are Shabbat observant in a certain way wouldn't have access to the news to know what had happened. So it turns out that one person decided that they were going to do something to help those who were Shabbat observant know that the rescue had happened. So this person wrote a note, and instead of sticking it in the cracks of the Kotel, of the Western Wall, they taped it onto the stone so that everybody could see it. And the note began, Shomrei Shabbat Hayekarim, Dear Shabbat Observers. I'm translating. I have no idea if you heard that four hostages were rescued alive. God willing, the others will be rescued soon. So this note was taped onto the Kotel. Now that might seem like a small thing, but I actually want to unpack that that is really a very, very beautiful thing because it cuts against the reality that we often experience, which is that as Jews, we often have feelings of resentment toward those who observe differently than we do. If we observe more than someone else, we might look down on them. And if someone else observes more than we do, we might think that they are looking down on us. It's just a remarkable phenomenon. It is human nature. I want to talk about it today because it's important, because it impacts communities. It certainly impacts families. Today is a day when we are thinking about loved ones who are no longer here. We understand that life is finite, and we all could probably tell stories about tensions that exist within families when it comes to observance, people looking up or looking down or wondering what is the other person thinking about me. And the second reason that I mention it today is because this is Zaman Matan Torah Tenu, the day of the giving of our Torah. And the question that I want to raise broadly is, should Torah be bringing us apart, bringing us together, or should Torah be tearing us apart? So I want to share with you two interpretations of what happens at Mount Sinai that are very different and suggest two different modes of how we can deal with Torah as families and as a community. The first suggests that when the Torah says by Yatzvu Betachtit Hahar, that the people were standing at the base of the mountain, that they were actually standing in order. So there was a certain order that took place. So the first group were the firstborn. And after them came the heads of the tribes, and after them came the elders, and after them the officers, and then all of the rest of the men of Israel, and then the children, and then the women, and then those who had converted to become part of the people. So there was, in a way, this hierarchy, which is very striking if you think about it. Now, there's another tradition which is quite different. It asks the question, why was the Torah given in the Midbar, in the wilderness? Why was it actually given in the land? And the answer that was given is because they didn't want any tribe to claim that because the Torah was given in our territory, that we have more of a claim than everybody else. Giving it in the wilderness democratized the Torah by doing it, as it were, in no person's land, it became the Torah of every person. I believe that we have such a tendency to break ourselves into tribes, and some tribes arrogate to themselves that they have a superior status and that their approach in their way is superior to the approaches of other people. And I want us now to just take a moment to honestly reflect on how this pans out in our own lives. If I were to ask you if you could think of a time when someone looked down on you because of how they compared their observance, their approach to your observance, to your approach, you could probably think of such a situation. 
If I asked you honestly to think about a time when you looked down on somebody else, when you kind of poo-pooed what they do, perhaps you could think about that as well. Sometimes we look down on other people who don't observe us strictly. Sometimes we look down on those who observe more strictly. We say, why aren't they as sophisticated as we are? Why haven't they evolved? Whatever it is, we use Torah to create rifts rather than to acknowledge our shared destiny. And this can happen within families. And I want to share a story that occurred within my family, a story that actually ended in a very positive way. So my sister and her family were planning to spend Passover with us. And I know that they take a certain view when it comes to koshering certain things that is more strict than the view that we take. So for example, I knew that they might have issue with us using our dishwasher on Passover. Now, why do I mention all of that detail? Because I decided I was going to be upfront and honest with my sister about this. And she thought about it and she said, you know what? Maybe Passover will be difficult for us to share, but let's make up a Shabbat right after Passover that we can share together. Now, this could have gone the other way. I could have said to her, I am insulted that you won't come and share Passover. That could have created who knows what. And sometimes that kind of thing does happen. Instead, I was honest with her and she was honest with me. And we were able to transcend and say, you know what? It might not work for this day, but our being together is important enough that we're going to find a time shortly thereafter. I want to invite us to think about all of the ways that Torah can pull us apart, that it can pull families apart, and to think of how we can be respectful, even honor each other's differences, but somehow find a way to be together. So I urge us to go back now to this person who wrote a note and put it onto the coattail. What was this person thinking? This person did not get caught up in there's this group and there's that group and that's a problem. And God knows that in the state of Israel right now, there's a lot of resentment that Israelis have towards one another. There is the external enemy, but there are also the resentments and the animosities that builds up within the Israeli larger community. So this person was saying, as it were, I do not want to abide by the image of receiving Torah that has us in hierarchy. I want to abide by the image of receiving Torah that says that it belongs to all of us. And I want my brothers and sisters to be able to celebrate the rescue of the hostages even if their observance is different from mine. This person was saying it is more important for us to be together as a people. God knows we have enough external enemies than to use Torah to tear us apart. This person was saying, in effect, that we are going to unite against those who hate us but we're also going to unite as a people to be able to celebrate the positive accomplishments that we have. When it comes to acknowledging our shared story and our shared mission, when it comes to recognizing as we do especially today that life doesn't last forever and that we have to find ways to transcend our differences, especially within families, we can't let the details get in the way. We can't let dishwashers get in the way of us be able to, able to share our Torah, our destiny, our mission as a people. Chag Sameach.